Digital transformation at Stanley Black & Decker. We know up front what we're trying to deliver and we work backwards and then that informs how we track and, and report against it. Measurement is very important. That's Catherine Monasabian, the president and general manager of North American Commerce for Stanley Black & Decker. You might know us for brands like Craftsman, um, Black & Decker, DeWalt, Stanley and more. We um, you know, operate globally across over 60 countries. Um, we have a history of innovation, but most recently, we, we, we've been um, very focused on um, ESG and, and social impact. You're almost 200 years old. You're undergoing this, uh, this transformation, this digital transformation. And so what does digital transformation mean for a company like Stanley Black & Decker? We're a very large business, and we are trying to do this during the one of the most you know, volatile times you know, in, in, in business on record. Um, so, you know, we're, we're doubling down um, specifically on, on e-commerce and more broadly e-business. It's one of the top priorities of the company. Why is e-commerce so important at the company at, at this time? And what are the forces that have sort of come together to raise that level of importance? So old rules have kind of been, been thrown out the door in terms of, you know, what is happening um, in the commercial landscape um, what is happening um, with uh, the, the the great resignation, inflation, uh, supply chain? I read the paper today, you know, about um, you know the the D 2 C darlings, the um, you know uh, Bitcoin. You know, like it, it's it's a it's a changing paradigm, and I think that the pace of change is going to only accelerate. So I think that this has um, kind of given us permission to really look at. Um, look at our business but with a clean sheet of paper, um, you know, to some extent reinvent ourselves. And, you know, Stanley Back and Decker has endured the test of time because of the ability to recalibrate and to adapt. Um, so I think e-commerce and more broadly speaking, um, you know, sort of digital um, are part of sort of the, the the new commercial. And we are very bullish and we've stated publicly are looking to um, to double our business um, in the in the near future. How does one transform a business that is so old and of this enormous scope? And how different is e-commerce from what you're currently doing? So how big a transformation and change is this? It's not just about um, you know sort of driving the transformation, but it's also about um, just new ways of working and thinking. We really go against the grain of almost everything that a that a you know large scale manufacturer um, you know sort of has in their DNA, um, from accounting to risk tolerance to um, you know just even thinking of things as a portfolio versus kind of long lead time um, ROI driven um, investment. So. It's, it, it is a definitely a massive challenge, but also exhilarating because there's, as I mentioned, you know, broad, you know, commitment that on this, this base of, you know, from going from good to great that we are, um, you know, tasked with, with really, um, you know, collectively, um, you know, reinventing sort of our everything from our go to market strategy to how we, um, you know, execute together to deliver business outcomes. You made a very interesting comment just now. You you brought in all of these different parts of the business, and on on the surface, if we talk about digital transformation, you know, you could say, well, we put up a website and we can sell stuff online, or rather, you know, e-commerce, right? We can we can we sell stuff online. So why is why do you have all of this? other stuff around it? Why is that so essential? Many of the initiatives that we are working on are, are first um, at SPD, which is exciting because there are new possibilities, but um, everything sort of on the periphery, you know, it, it involves new capabilities, new skill sets. Um, we're often going against the grain of kind of like how we do things. Um, so I think that um, it's not just about um, sort of being an innovation group or a project. We are tasked with sort of taking these ideas and concepts and then evolving them into hard execution plans that ultimately deliver to business outcomes and you know growth and profitability. So I think the challenge is how do you take sort of this intention and translate it 
um, into, um, you know, embed it into the ways of working and the thinking, and then ultimately deliver uh, execution-wise against, um, you know, sort of net new um, ways of working and ideas and business models. So I, I think, you know, it's not just about a discrete effort. It's it's really um, transformation um, end-to-end at the organization. Why is it not just about a discrete effort? The, the reason I'm kind of drilling down yeah into this point is because, again, on the surface, whether it's Stanley Black & Decker or any other company, when we think of e-commerce, for example, we think of, you know, a website. And I don't think everybody really appreciates the extent to which innovation, as you just described it, going into execution, must have tentacles everywhere. And so I think, so can you unpack that a little bit for us? Digital transformation is in vogue. Everyone's doing it. It's the creative or it's the, um, you know, there's a lot of jargon. Um, the board says, you know, to do, you know, we go for shiny object, but it really, to be in, in this kind of role and to really create sustained sustain change, you really have to kind of embrace um, system thinking. You have to look upstream and downstream. You have to kind of operate on the edge of what's possible. You There are financial, logistics, um, legal brand ramifications to really um, be able to deliver at anything. You're sort of a system and any one of those is a point of failure. So in a highly matrix kind of global organization, um, you can't really run, uh, uh, you know, by consensus or 80% steering committees, or, um, you know, you kind of have 40% of the information, forget 80, 40, and you got it, you got to go. There's not perfection. Um, it's not all about efficiency and squeezing um, productivity out of repeatable processes. So it may seem trivial, like to, you know, launch a business that, you know, innovators dilemma that is, you know, uh, could be perceived as distracting, dilutive, et cetera. But um, it's actually highly, highly complex to be able to execute and then ultimately to scale into a, you know, into a a commercial strategy. And we were very clear when we started that we are not a center of excellence. We are not sort of ideators, um, ivory tower, you know, disconnected from the grind of the day. We want to seat at the commercial table and we want to have a P&L. And so that creates a lot of pressure to to deliver against hard outcomes. So it's actually very, um, very complex from an execution perspective. Um, The intention is, is almost easier um, than than the actual delivery. I've spoken with other people who don't have a PNL, but who, like you, are very focused on innovation, and that creates some opportunities. But as you said, it also creates some disconnects because without that PNL, it's very hard to get the real visibility and priority inside the business. You want to be interconnected commercially, I believe, and and you want to, you know, sort of um, be tied to hard outcomes. Like if something that you're innovating doesn't have, I, I don't think without exception, a customer benefit or a um, strategic, you know, innovation for innovation's sake doesn't work. But um, and you do need to incubate or ring fence or, you know, protect against the antibodies um, that, you know, otherwise you, you just can't move, right? You would never, again, innovators love, but you'd never put a dollar into something that it, you'd squeeze the core um, when, you know, in a constrained environment. But we went with kind of a hybrid. We we, we do believe in the, in the um, connectivity with our overall go-to-market strategy. We don't think that e-business or e-commerce will have the e. We think it, it will just be the ways of working in the very near future. But we do have on some of the growth areas a little bit of um, not, not segregation, but a little bit of um, incubation where they can work in small pods, where they can align around business efforts, where they're end-to-end accountable for things like technology delivery, um, and um, ultimately for, um, you know, decision making. So I think companies flex back and forth, centralized, decentralized, and the pendulum swings, and um, it depends on the digital maturity. There's a lot of, there's no cookie cutter answer to org design or to, um, but we went with a hybrid approach, but the P&L for, for me is, is, is very critical that it, it's really closely connected with the broader company um, commercial strategy. We have a very interesting question from Twitter, and this is from Arsalan Khan. Arsalan is a regular listener, asks great questions, and thank you, Arsalan, for that. 
And, and Arsalan says, how did you convince people at all levels in the organization that digital transformation is about business transformation and also about data transformation and how you use data? It's not just enough. Paint a compelling vision, enroll everybody, you know, get your resistors on, you know, it, if it could only be that easy, right? In, in especially in a, again, a very matrix organization, like herding the cats to execute can be very problematic because it doesn't necessarily, the intention doesn't necessarily tie to actions and behaviors and incentives and, and, and such. So um, for us, a lot of the, the breakdown was, um, was not in the overall um, enrollment. I think that there is, is broad, um, you know, belief in the strategy. I think it, it, it sort of was more in the, in the day-to-day opening and reopening of decisions and really um, getting sort of from an execution perspective, things, um, you know, across the finish line. So I think, you know, we worked on, we did everything from a road show. Um, we did road shows with all of our cross-functional partners. We sat it in their town halls. We have very strong um, executive sponsorship and internal champions, but a lot of it was, um, you know, just setting clear objectives that can help make the right decisions on a day-to-day um, and, you know, really um, understand, you know, it, enroll folks in foundation setting versus, you know, the sequencing of sort of more um, shiny object or more, um, you know, sort of uh, upper funnel type of, 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 of efforts. Um, but it, it, it definitely is hard. And I don't know that, that we're, we're, we're there. I think we're there philosophically. I don't know if we are, um, you know, we still struggle with, you know, with um, decision rights. With um, you know, sort of a commitment and a sustained focus. So it, it, I wish there was a, a very simple answer, but there, unfortunately, I think the playbooks for change are very um, culturally um, and company maturity specific. What about the data aspect? I, that's another part of Arslan's question: getting people to be data focused. The company believes again on a philosophical level of that data is important and that we should have fact-based, data-driven sort of investment decisions and such. I think um, the challenge is, especially in growth areas, is that the data doesn't fit the mold of a of a um, sort of a financial return. Um, you know, sort of um, you know, there, there are a lot of other metrics like speed to deliver, for instance, or customer, you know, um, receptivity or, um, and things that are sort of more proof of concepts, you don't have that robustness up front. And those are not seen as, okay, the data is then to inform decision-making. It's sort of a hindsight and a readout post, um, you know, but I think, you know, we, we are, I think, again, philosophically aligned, but how much the data is sort of driving day-to-day um, decision making and um, and sort of embedded into the day to day operating decisions is is sort of the next the next um, phase of the journey. You've mentioned customers a few times. For example, just now you were talking that sometimes uh, that looking looking at, for example, financial metrics alone may not, or I'll just add, uh, for example, uh, efficiency metrics may not tell the complete story regarding customer satisfaction, customer retention, things like that. So it seems that there is a leap of faith that the company needs to take when embarking on this kind of transformation that things are going to be okay and that there's a relearning process as well. Yes and yes. We believe this is the right thing to do. We don't have the absolute clarity on the future um, you know, we don't have the precision that, you know, that it's not, you know, manufacturing line where you, you know, where you have, there is ambiguity. And so you have to lead from the front and you have to have that senior level endorsement that this is a, a, a important um, and we're not kind of like relitigating it every day and trying to figure out, you know, is it, is it or is it not a priority? Um, that said, we try to hold ourselves to kind of hard outcomes um, and I think that those are, are important and we approach everything as a kind of a 
a pilot or an experiment, um, which helps de-risk the upfront investment. And then we can um, sort of build the business case through iteration. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, how we think about um, performance metric and even the mindset of like performance base versus fixed budget is like radically different, right? That there is no floor and ceiling, that it's really um, kind of iterative or even the idea that you test and learn and scale um, and that um, it, it's just so different from our core business. So I I, 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 yes, there has to be some kind of leap of faith that this is the right thing to do um, strategically, but there also, I think, um, to you, you really do need to get points on the board to really get the credibility to, to bring others along. Um, it's not just about um, sort of um, selling. You do really need to um, have kind of hard performance metrics and define success tied to commercial outcomes or tied to customer outcomes or tied to, you know, it can't just be um, sort of innovation theater. Now, please take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button at the top of our website so we can send you our newsletter and keep you up to date on the amazing shows coming up. So you started with pilots or how, to, how did you manage that? I don't want to put words in your mouth we do almost everything in that way. Like, so we, we don't go big bang. Um, almost, we, we never go big bang. We always start with sort of a small scale, um, you know, sort of approach to, um, to, to launching something. And we've, you know, sort of deployed technology that allows us to, um, you know, sort of test in a capital light way and move quickly with speed. And then, you know, if something works, you, throw gas on it and, you know, and, and you go, but I think that's been um, easier to get future funding. If you're showing momentum on the investments that, 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 that have been made and that's easier. Um, it's easier for more mature areas to show a return because, you know, e-commerce is just growing. So it, it's one of the biggest growth opportunity. So it's easier to get a return than it is for something net new, right? Something net new that has a lot of risk, you know, that's, that's an experiment. It's harder to get points on the board before asking for a financial decision. So like one technology decision, when I first started, I probably spoke to like a hundred people, uh, you know, in the organization, you know, just sharing the vision, the ask, the business impact. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do think that it's important to, um, in something that is, is new to really, um, approach it iteratively, not just to de-risk, but even just to, um, you know, go speed is your currency. So just to go quicker and then to kind of gain the trust of the organization before kind of asking for a, a larger commitment. So when we talk about digital transformation, a lot of times people talk about, well, we need to put the customer at the center of what we're doing. And you mentioned business model earlier. So where does the customer weave into this story? However you define it. Our customers are retailers, our distributors, um, and obviously their success is, is our success, and we have a very strong commitment. Um, and it's really, you know, an open door because they're on the same journey that that, that we are. Um, you know, I was just at a at a customer summit um, last week, and we discussed like data and insights and um, assortment and you know dropship and you know, bundling promo strategy. What about the the cultural aspect? Again, with digital transformation, I have heard from many business leaders that the culture change part is the hardest. And so let me ask you first, why is culture change necessary? You know, to put up a website, obviously, uh, you know, it's hyperbole, I'm playing devil's advocate here, but you put up a new website. And so we have to change the company. So I'm, I'm going back to that again. It's, it just stuck in my mind. It's so, it's a hard concept to get across sometimes that, that the extent of change that's necessary. What is the saying like culture uh, eats strategy for, for breakfast? You know, it's 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 definitely culture. There's underlying rules of how things get done that are kind of unspoken is probably one of the biggest, um, you know, challenges or enablers of sort of, of transformation, because I think it's really is ultimately all about um, about about people. Um, and so I think that um, getting, you know, sort of the, the ways of working for 
you know, for e-business is, is, is just very, very different. So you work, um, it's, it's not hierarchical. Um, you're working in an iterative fashion. You mentioned agile, but it really is, you know, we, that's a little bit, you know, used as a, you know, as a loosely, but, you know, but in terms of, you know, iterating a product versus, you know, sort of having consensus driven um, ways of, of, you know, 12 people for a decision, it doesn't, it doesn't work from an execution perspective. So it does require cultural change to be able to um, create these pods that are empowered with accountability for financial results and decision making, and that are able to um, execute. And then also, um, you know, when we were hiring the team, um, you know, we wanted this infusion of talent, like our team has, you um, experience from agencies, from, you know, startups, from like hybrid work has given us access to unmatched talent. But if we were to bring them all in and set them, you know, sort of up separately, I I don't know that they would be successful, not knowing the industry, the product, the, um, you know, the the culture of the company. So we had intention around our org design to have 50% um, internal folks to really marry this sort of um, the speed that comes from B2C and the agility with sort of the institutional knowledge and the um, industry and product knowledge that comes from, you know, from having built the the company. Um, And so I think that that has helped us um, kind of maintain this, the subculture of, um, you know, of sort of uh, execution focus, commercially oriented speed, but also um, sort of infuse it with all the, um, you know, again, back to the, I really feel strongly that it has to tie to the overall strategic objectives of the company. But culture is definitely, um, you know, it, it, it's unsaid. So it's almost the hardest to, to tackle because it, it's, you can't even articulate it. It's those unwritten rules. And so you can have all of the, um, intention but if if the behaviors don't follow there's a breakdown and we have a, another question arsalan comes back again with a question and he says uh, this is about metrics uh, are there metrics that you thought were useless to collect for digital transformation and what metrics are you actually trying to collect so i think he's trying to get to the distinction between traditional metrics and digital transformation metrics? So I think, I don't know if they're useless, but I think a lot of the times we, we force fit um, sort of, um, we back into um, some of our businesses. It, you know, we, we've got a wholesale DNA. So this is sort of like how we, we back into um, the paradigm of a customer, which is our, our distributor. And so we, we have financial reporting metrics that are not, may not be leading metric, you know, indicators that really um, don't measure things like um, engagement, don't measure things like um, customer satisfaction, that don't measure things that are um, even just speed, as I mentioned, of deployment and such. I don't know that they're they're useless. I just think that they don't um, for growth areas that they just don't um, they don't help inform sort of the roadmap or the direction because they are sort of uh, backwards looking and they're purely financial. So we've been working on a lot of, you know, sort of um, OKRs or, or the performance indicators. Um, and we want to basically a lot of, um, as I mentioned, everything we do is a, is a test or a, an experiment. So we know upfront what we're trying to deliver and we work backwards um, and, and um, know how we're defining success. And then that informs like how we um, track and, and report against it. But I do think that um, measurement is very important. I thought it was very interesting what you just described about engagement. Obviously, online selling and online engagement is so completely different from retail, and I'm sure from the the history of Stanley Black and Decker. So, any any uh, thoughts on on engagement and the the digital relationship that you have with your customers? E business is very broad, so it could be um, something like our B two B platform. We just worked on reporting for that. Um, it's not. It's you know orders assisted orders from a customer, you know, from our sales rep, because it's an enablement tool as well, to customer orders, to amount of logins, to usage, 
you know, to, um, you know, uh, average order to like suit so there. And then all the typical, you know, conversion, um, uh, you know, traffic, all of the, the typical, you know, web KPIs. So I don't know that there's like a templated, like, you know, um, one size fits all. I think it's really about abstracting away from, from, from the report and really trying to understand what decisions are we trying to make? Um, you know, not reports or dashboards for dashboards sake, but like what, who is going to use this information in what way, and then let that inform sort of what, um, what the right metrics are, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. So really having uh, clarity around the specific business goal that you're trying to accomplish and, and begin there. It sounds like that's what you're saying. It sounds very obvious, but I think sometimes you lose sight of that because there's, so much data sometimes that it, it it's it's um you know you can get lost in sort of the um, sophistication of the you know of the reporting but lose sight of like what who is using this and what decisions are we trying to drive because that's the it, you know it's really to inform decision making right it's not it, it's the yes to track investment and to track performance but it's really um you know, simplifying it to what what's the business objective and then letting that guide um, reporting requirements. Why is this challenge so hard? And why do we sometimes lose track of the fact that we need to begin with the business objective, right? It sounds like a very obvious thing to say, but it's not so obvious, not so easy sometimes. I don't think it is because now it's getting more sophisticated, right? You have big data, you've got AI, you've got more access to data, you're scraping websites, you're getting, you know, customer information, you're getting insights, you're getting panel that like there's so much that um, how do you distill it into the actual use cases and the, um, you know, sort of the, the very simple business objectives. So I think it it's not, it, it just gets lost sometimes because there is so much more access now than ever before um, of, of sort of, um, and there's so much measurability of really understanding that it's um, it's only as good as, as the decisions that it drives. And so um, I think sometimes it just gets lost when you have a lot more um, reporting sophistication and a lot more um, just volume of data. So a big part of this then, there, there's this data overload problem that you you as a company, and I was I was going to ask whether you as the president of this group have to manage. We have sort of centralized and decentralized functions. So there's a lot of centralized data teams that we leverage daily that are, you know, um, very tied into sort of our priorities. But then um, on some of the more um, early stage, scrappier efforts, we are sort of working on those with our own dedicated sort of finance, um, you know, and analytics teams. So it's a hybrid. There's a lot that we that we borrow from the broader strength of the organization. And then there are some things that are very specific to our efforts, which we kind of have end to end um, accountability for. What it's like managing a business in this inflationary environment where it's hard to find people, it's you know we have a a war going on. I mean, how, how do you how do you plan? How do you manage through this uncertainty? It's definitely daunting, um, you know, to say the least. And um, you know, as I mentioned, we have like incredible talent, and we're really proud of the culture. Um, you know, that, that we've built, but, um, you know, just everything has changed, right? Like, I don't know you, Michael, but when I got my first job, I was like, so happy for the paycheck, you know, like I would be the last one in and, you know, uh, I mean, the last one out, first one in, you know, and now it's like, there's just values have shifted. Like it's not, it's, it's about, you know, meaning and purpose and professional development. And there are customers now, employees, they, they're in charge. And so the way I view it is, you know, you know, and, and as you mentioned, it's like a, a frothy market and, you know, these skill sets command a huge premium. And so I think you just have to um, kind of compete on experience 
And like everyone that I that I know that's joined SBD, they they want to be at the center of transformation at you know one of the largest companies in the world, and um, they want to be builders. They they don't want to think incrementally. They want to um, sort of challenge the status quo. They want to um, deliver impact. And so I think that's something no one else can offer. So I, I think that you know just embracing the opportunity and to really differentiate the the sort of the the experience. I have to say, recently I spoke with two different CMOs and two different companies, and they both were agonizing over the fact that they're competing for talent with the Googles and the Facebooks of the world and the incredible cost and the expectations that folks are having because of the bar that's being set by the largest tech companies. And I have to assume some of that must filter to you because in a way you're operating a tech company with inside, inside Stanley Bat Black & Decker. Absolutely. I mean, I said to someone, I wanted to get a, an architect at one of our partners and he, he laughed and he said, good, good luck, you know? Um, and so you definitely have to be creative to get the skill sets that you need. Um, when the premiums in the, you know, in terms of um, in, in the market are just so, um, you know, it's just intensifying every day. Um, so I, I, I definitely think um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a de- a definitely, it's not just like the gig economy and, you know, and all of the, you know, COVID, it, there's just, so, there's so many dynamics that have, have changed um, sort of the, the talent game. And we have a, a very detailed question from Twitter. So let me ask and see whether you can answer this. Do you provide data sandboxes to play and experiment with data for people who are not directly involved with collecting the data? The analytics team that we have, we have an analytics um, and um, AI team, you know, may, we don't, but I love the idea of like, what do you see here, you know, with, with sort of... Um, you know, what, I, I love that outside in perspective, you know, sometimes a, a lot of the challenges are just so close to the details. You, you might not see, you know, the forest from the trees because you, you're, you're too close to the intended outcome and, you know, all our biases come out. So I, I like the idea of, of, um, you know, sort of opening it up to someone external. What advice do you have for business leaders who are, who hear this and are faced with the kind of transformation that you're undertaking. So where do you begin? Where does somebody begin with this? I think just with the humility that it's hard, you know, and it's, um, it's, it's messy and, you know, it's, it's, it's trendy, but it's, it's, uh, you know, right now, but that's not really um, what it is sort of in the trenches. Um, and, you know, I guess my advice is just to approach everything with kind of curiosity with beginner's mind, learn and, and change and, you know, all the things, you know, over communicate that are in sort of change management playbook, but um, just stay positive and just realize you're in great company because I mean, Michael, you talk to people from like every industry, every single industry is flexing now to this constant change and reinvention. So you're, you're in great company that ev- everyone is like, you know, from the department stores to the, you know, early stage startups to everything in between is, you know, is, is, is sort of reinventing. So um, just to, you know, stay in the game. I love what you just said that digital transformation is trend trendy, but not if you're in the trenches. You can quote me, yes, it's, but isn't that the truth? Absolutely. You know, the thing is, you read about all of this trendy stuff, and at a very high level, if somebody's writing about it or, you know, presenting it from a marketing standpoint, if you're a software vendor, but if you're actually in the trenches doing it, things don't always line up quite as neatly as, as in theory. No, and you have to keep the right mindset and stay, stay, um, committed and resilient and, um, you know, and kind of take the punches and keep going. So it, it is imperfect and messy and hard. Why mindset? What does that have to do with any of this? 
I mean, mindset is, I think is like, is the majority of it, right? You have to basically um, really have bold thinking, right? You have to be able to um, think beyond, you know, sort of incremental changes. You have to be able to handle the, the people. You have to be able to bounce back from setbacks. You have to be able to, um, you know, sort of look, as I mentioned before, upstream and downstream. It's not just about what you're doing. It affects, you know, sort of all these other areas. And really understanding the, you know, the consequences of some of these, you know, sort of changes. So I think the mindset of that it's not, there's no, if there were a playbook, right, there wouldn't be, a, you know, that there that the, it's it's iterative and it's, um, you know, it's it's not going to happen overnight. And it's a journey that can't happen with any one team or any one person. And um, just, you know, sort of that that mindset of of, um, you know being resilient and, and being sort of a builder. Well, unfortunately we're out of time. So I, I want to say a huge thank you to Catherine Monasabian. She is the president and general manager of North American commerce at Stanley Black and Decker. And Catherine, I just can't thank you enough for taking time to be with us today. Thank you for hosting. It was a lot of fun. And thank you to everybody who watched and especially to those folks who asked questions. I love your questions. I th do, doing this live really is a uh, homage to the folks who watch and to ask those great questions. Now, before you go, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button at the top of our website so we can send you our newsletter and tell your friends because we have actually incredible shows coming up. Everybody, thank you so much for watching and we will see you again next time. Have a great day.